Well, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Soha Iqbal uh, to uh, DocWire. Uh, she's going to be chatting with us today about uh, women's heart health. Uh, Dr. Iqbal is the Chief of Cardiology at Salem Hospital. She uh, joined the team at Mass General Brigham as an interventional cardiologist uh, at Salem and Mass General Hospital in May of 2020. Uh, after receiving her MD at Harvard Medical School and completing her internal medicine residency at Columbia in New York. Um, she then completed uh, training in cardiology and interventional cardiology at NYU Langer Medical Center and stayed on faculty there for over a decade before she made the move back to the Boston area. Uh, at NYU, she held the positions of assistant professor of medicine, associate director of cardiac cath lab at Bellevue Hospital. She's active in many national societies and currently holds leadership roles in the American College of Cardiology and the Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions, currently as a committee chair for the Women in Intervention Mentoring Committee. So we are thrilled to have you here. Um, and personally, since I know you uh, both as a person and as a clinician, I'm thrilled that you're here chatting with us today. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So, you know, just to kind of start off, I think one of the things that's always gotten to me is, is that, you know, despite the fact that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States, studies have consistently shown that utilization of cardiac procedures are far higher in men than compared with women, and that's independent of disease prevalence or severity. So in your practice, your experience, vast experience, you know, have you observed this? So I had that question pretty early on and actually was able to look through the NCDR data in about 2017. And we looked at specifically the, the STEMI population, the women and men coming in with MIs. And we saw even up until about 2017, there was a, a delay in care uh, for women coming in with heart attacks. And um, I just needed to know those numbers and get that out there because I think with that knowledge, we'll be able to, to get out. Um, we can work on making that better. So yes, I think that there's so many factors that go into why there's delay of care. And as you asked, um, you know, less procedures being done in women, maybe not in the acute setting, but even in kind of stable settings. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, how they present. I, I don't know if you ever heard this, Suzanne. I was taught that the reason people say heart attacks are presented with chest pain was it's based on the Framingham data right here in Massachusetts, where we both are, um, that was all men. And that was like, you know, a long time ago. And that was how people decided chest pain equaled heart attack. So I think we've kind of done ourselves a disservice and we're working backwards on that way to make sure our patients understand that that's not how we, that all, all people present classically. And then we have to do well in our medical communities for people to understand that. Well, I think that even brings into something that, you know, is, is also a known issue, which is that, you know, women are chronically underrepresented in cardiac device trials. And, you know, what ends up resulting from that is exactly what you just said, which is, is that we have uh, understanding of the disease processes that are really derived so much from, from, our, from, our, from our male patients. Um, and that can lead to not understanding how well treatments um, are, are, are effective for, for women or as well as how, how different disease processes can present. Um, certainly, you know, I know that there's some, you know, female predominant cardiac conditions that I feel like we're just really starting to think more and more about um, over, you know, the last few years that are really kind of coming up um, you know, has that been, you know, what's your experience been with some of, some of these conditions? So I feel really privileged that I was kind of introduced to this very early on in my training uh, over 15 years ago with Dr. Harmony Reynolds, and she and I partnered together with looking at uh, women who came in with heart attacks. And the way I said is, looks like a heart attack, smelled like a heart attack, and they would have angiographically normal coronaries. And I just remember um, one of my, you know, male interventional attendings telling a woman like, oh, you're fine. And I'm like, wait, what do you mean she's fine? She had a, like, it sounds like a heart attack. Why? What did we, what are we missing? So I was super excited to do that research a while ago, which has really come a long way since then. But we looked at intravascular ultrasound on these women, realized we were missing diagnoses um, in that, you know, 15 years ago, including, you know, plaque rupture that wasn't causing obstructive disease, as well as, um, SCAD, which I, uh, which you know, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. I think that we really uh, started started that you know a few decades ago, and it's come a long way. And we're realizing we're underdiagnosing that, and also then not if we underdiagnose it, we can't tell our patients what happened to them, and then we can't help them take action as well as our colleagues taking care of them, how to take care of, um, how to how to medically treat them. So I think this is all very important. 
Absolutely agree. I think it's one of the things certainly I've seen in my practice that, you know, the more that there's been more understanding about these sorts of conditions, things like, you know, Minoka or SCAD, Takotsubo, that I feel like we're seeing them more and more. And the reality is, is I don't think that they're necessarily occurring a whole lot more. I think we're just recognizing that they're there. So exactly to your point, where we've got patients who are saying, oh, you're fine. No, it's just that we're not actually recognizing what's going on. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that, that I think falls on us as a medical community to not only educate our patients um, about different conditions, different presentations, but also our fellow providers as well. Right. And the more, and there's just knowledge gaps still in what we know. So it's really important that, uh, you know, we continue to do research in that and kind of delve a little bit deeper. Well, I absolutely agree. I, and one of the things I think, you know, one of the things I, you know, kind of brought up before is, is that since women are underrepresented in, in clinical trials, you know, how can we, how can we address that? How can we get women uh, to enroll more in clinical trials, our female patients? And, you know, what can we do to kind of improve um, participation and improve essentially representation uh, in the clinical trials so we can understand um, these disease processes better? Do you have any thoughts, any ideas about what we can do? Uh, if I could get my patients to go to cardiac rehab, my female patients, I feel like I'm winning something here. So, but hearing, but knowing that about my patients, knowing that they'll minimize, they'll wait at home because they will have to take care of something before they come in with their symptoms, um, knowing that they'll tell me that they're going to, you know, put themselves first and not their families and try to get to cardiac rehab and then seeing them come in and not having the time for it. I, it makes me really realize why we're not seeing women in trials. So uh, things that I have kind of encouraged um, uh, my colleagues at Mass General, who I partner with in a lot of studies is, you know, you can't have your research studies uh, main, you know, discussion be at 6 p.m. on Zoom. Yes, it's on Zoom, but 6 p.m. maybe when their children are, or when they're making dinner, I think, realizing what our female patients are doing kind of really at the, the you know, nuts and bolts level at home will really help us uh, tailor research to help them um, feel like they, they can participate. I think that's really important. I think that makes a really good point about really bringing, taking medicine out per se of the hospital and bringing it to the patient and the patient's doorsteps. And I think that is going to be some ways that we can, you know, understand the communities that we're treating um, and, and in doing that, be able to really, um, improve the representation because it isn't just women, obviously, it's also underserved minorities as well that are underrepresented other underrepresented in these trials and understanding what are the cultural differences, what are the social barriers and what can we do to make it better? And it can be things like this is when, this isn't a good time for a woman to be part of a trial because she's picking her kids up from school or this isn't a good time for, you know, X person to be part of this trial because, you know, they're getting off the late shift from work, you know, and I think being really kind of sensitive and thoughtful um, on that, on those sorts of things that are very, very tangible and important things to our patients, hopefully will help um, improve some of the representation as well. Speaking right. of representation, and I know you and I can feel this both very much, uh, you know, interventional cardiology is a predominantly male field. 5% uh, of women, 5% uh, of interventional cardiologists are women. So there's two of us uh, on this call right now, um, which I think is, you know, amazingly awesome. Um, but, you know, as we think about trying to increase and improve the, uh, the pipeline and getting more uh, female representation into uh, the interventional uh, cardiology community, um, what's your experience as a woman as an interventional cardiologist been like? And do you have any thoughts about how we can improve female representation in the field itself? Yeah, so um, I feel it's really exciting to see more and more women in this field, even in the last 15 years since I've, you know, kind of worked my way into the field. I think I just loved it. So I kind of put my head down and powered through. And now just now reflecting on, you know, the things that we could have done, we can do differently. Um, and I focus on the fact that we as a community just need to not discourage women. And people don't realize that they're doing that. But if, if a woman suggests that they're interested in cardiology or interventional cardiology, kind of leaving the questions of, when are you going to have a family if you're, you know, training for so long or, you know, the comments about like, oh, well, your husband's going to miss you or something like that. You know, we, I think that discouragement, it may just be 
comments, but I have seen a lot of women get turned away, um, turned off, I guess, from potentially um, doing interventional cardiology. Luckily, uh, we have programs um, such that you and I are part of, mentorship committees, that we can show, you know, we can kind of pull a lot of these women back and say, no, actually, you know, this, these are the questions that you may have that we can answer in terms of lifestyle, in terms of training, in terms of what your day-to-day -day life could be. Um, so I think that that's the number one thing, honestly, is we should encourage women, but on top of that, we need to have our community members not discourage women. I think that's number one on my end. Thoughts on your end? I think that, I mean, I think that's great and encourage and, encourage and not discourage. And, and I think, you know, having, um, I think it's really does, you know, not to, not to use the Twitter hashtag he for she, you know, cause I, I hate using Twitter hashtags, <laughs> but I think that's really important to think of that. This is not just a female issue. This is, this is a community issue. This is an international cardiology uh, issue as well. And so, like you said, let's not have any discouraging comments. Let's be encouraging. And, and certainly, and I don't want to speak for you. I was lucky enough to have uh, my male attending who encouraged me to go into interventional. And I was the one saying, uh, I don't think I can, I should do it. I'm not really sure. It's, uh, it's a long training process, all the radiation. And, and he sat me down and was like, no, you can do this. We need you in the field. And, and it is, you know, I really, I'm grateful every day, um, grateful every day for, for, for that sort of support. And so hoping that, you know, kind of the rest of the community can, when they see that, you know, eager young female fellow uh, can say, hey, we need you, we need you, we need you in here. Because I think, I do think having better representation uh, in our community, in the interventional community, will help trickle down to better care for our female patients, better representation of our female patients in clinical trials, better understanding of these female predominant uh, cardiac conditions, um, which again will translate to better cardiac care. No, yeah, absolutely. And we know as you know, medical field, it's good to have diversity within the field so that we can you know, take care of our diverse population. So uh, I think that the more, the more women we can get, the more diversity we can get, the stronger we will be as a field. You know, everyone will be better off on that. Completely agree. Well, Dr. Jabal, I really want to thank you for taking the time to uh, chat with us tonight and um, hope to see you soon. Great. Thanks so much. This was fun.